Dear brothers and sisters, we welcome you to this Philippines area broadcast for stake, district, ward, and branch councils. This broadcast is being transmitted to, by a satellite to all stake and district centers in the country. My name is Michael John Te of the Philippines Area Presidency, and I will be conducting this meeting. We recognize the attendance of Elder Brent H. Nielsen and Elder Ian S. R. Dern, also of the Philippines Area Presidency. We also recognize the presence here with us of Sister Te, Sister Nielsen, and Sister R. Dern, who are seated on the con in the congregation. We thank President Noblesa, the President of the Caloocan Philippine Stake, for hosting this broadcast tonight. Our chorister for this evening is Sister Ednalyn Ang, and our pianist is Sister Noemi Pecundo. We will open this meeting by singing hymn number five, High on the Mountain Top. Following the singing, Bishop Roberto Angeles will offer the invocation. And then, following the invocation, we will be blessed to hear from Elder Brent H. Nielsen of the 70. Precious Heavenly Father, we bow our heads before thee this time to give thee thanks for the many blessings that thou bestowed upon us. We thank thee, Heavenly Father, for thy Son Jesus Christ, for his atonement, and for his love for us. We thank thee, Heavenly Father, for our living prophet, Thomas S. Monson. We thank thee for the priesthood and especially the calling and responsibilities that we have to help to build the Zion in this land. Heavenly Father, we ask thee this time, please bless us with the strength, spiritually and physically, so that we may be able to do our job, especially in helping our fellow men. Heavenly Father, we ask thee also, to bless us with the Holy Ghost this evening as we listen to our earlier leaders for their upcoming goals and also that we may be able to enhance whatever things that they will give to us this evening. Heavenly Father, we ask all of these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Thank you. Brothers and sisters, last year at this time we met with you and introduced to you the area goals for 2012. It was an important moment for all of us as leaders in the church because it allowed us to identify a vision and become united as we establish the church together in the Philippines. We have been very impressed with what you have accomplished in your individual wards and branches. It has been a miracle to see the results of your good efforts, but we have only begun. There are still mountains to climb and rivers to cross as we move the work forward with faith here in the Philippines. Tonight, it is our hope to share with you what we have accomplished together and to look forward to the 2013 and share with you our new goals. They will look very familiar to you and you will see that our emphasis has not changed, but we have added a few new items that will sharpen our focus. I will review our progress and introduce our new goals, and then Elder Tay will teach us about the changes to the goals this year and the significance of those changes. Elder Ardern will then share ideas with us that will stimulate our thoughts towards receiving revelation as we determine how we can achieve these goals in our individual wards and branches in 2013. So let me begin by showing you where we have come from and where we are going. This past year, the center of our goals has been to feast upon the words of Christ. We understand that doctrine, properly understood, changes behavior. It is the study of the doctrine that leads to conversion. And it is the study of doctrine that helps us become better husbands and wives, parents and children. This year, thousands of members have diligently feasted upon the words of Christ and have felt the power of the Spirit come into their lives. It has strengthened them and their families. May we share with you a few examples of members who have been lifted this year as they have feasted upon the words of Christ. Nagbabasa ako ng scriptures gabi-gabi bago matulog. I read the scriptures after saying my morning prayers. Nagbabasa po ako ng scriptures araw-araw. I read the scriptures every morning when I woke up. Nagbabasa ako ng scriptures araw-araw tuwing tanghali bago pumasok ng school. I usually read the scriptures at night, but when I find time in the morning, then I do it in the morning. I read the scriptures every day. Nagbabasa po ako ng scriptures, napapalapit po ako kay Heavenly Father at kay Jesus Christ. My testimony in the Lord Jesus Christ has increased and I feel the Spirit of the Lord guide me as I make my daily choice. Ang mga blessings po na natatanggap ko kapag nagbabasa ako ng scriptures ay nadadagdagan po ang kaalaman ko tungkol sa Ebanghelyo ni Yesu Cristo at mas nagiging mabuti po akong bata at mas nagiging mabuti po akong anak at kapatid. My testimony about Jesus Christ grow and by reading the scripture, I can handle and overcome the challenges and temptations that comes into my life. Ang mga natatanggap ko blessings kapag nagbabasa ako ng scriptures, lumalakas ang aking loob na ishare ang aking talent sa ibang tao na binibigay sa akin ng Diyos. I would say that I have gained a stronger testimony of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ through Joseph Smith and uh, just the power of the atonement of Jesus Christ in my life and to others. Whenever I read the scriptures, I feel closer to my Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. As we move forward into 2013, we know that we have much to do to help our members understand the doctrine, and so we are retaining Feast Upon the Words of Christ at the center of our goals. It is our hope and prayer that thousands more of our members 
will experience the revelatory blessing of the scriptures and understand that it is the key to hearing the voice of the Lord and receiving revelation for themselves and for their families. This past year, we have encouraged our members to strengthen their families by holding family home evening, participating in daily family prayer and scripture study, and with each member having their own set of scriptures. We also asked each of the wards and branches to increase the number of temple recommend holders. We are pleased to report that this year, 35,909 members purchased their own set of scriptures. During 2012, we were also able to increase the number of temple recommend holders in the Philippines. We increased them from 30,519 to 32,722. This is 2,200 additional members who have received their recommends this year. We would like to share with you some examples of families in the Philippines who have been strengthened this year as they have focused on these goals together. Ginagawa po namin ang family home evening namin kada gabi ng lunes. We usually have our family prayer before we go to bed. We read the scriptures together as a family every night, usually at 6 o'clock p.m. before we eat dinner and before our children study their lessons at school. What we gain the most is ang pagmamahala namin sa bawat isa. Uh, the way we treat each other at uh, ang social at emotional na aspeto ng kailang uh, buhay especially yung pakikisama at pakikisalamuha nila sa uh, tao sa pamamahay namin at sa labas My family have gained a firm testimony of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and a strong determination and a strong family ties we have gained um, with my children uh, harmony and unity so i know we are blessed with that so that is why i'm very grateful because we have gained that uh, testimony i love to read the scriptures because it can help me know more about jesus christ and bring me closer to him reading the scriptures makes me want to follow the savior's prayer each family needed a powerful source of our strength and that I will really assure you when you have the gospel in each heart of a member of our family we have a better and a strong family and I testify that when, when we find ourselves in happiness the real happiness is in here in the gospel of Jesus Christ sometimes when we've been in the mall or sometimes when we are in vacation the happiness is just for a moment but when we are gathered as a family in reading of the scriptures, there's the real happiness, even the saying that a little bit of heaven here on earth. It is a wonderful way for us, even to all family, to nourish as a father, as a holder of the priesthood of the Lord. We are so blessed to raise a family in righteousness and in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 2013, we will continue to diligently follow this important prescription to strengthen our families. You might notice that this year we have added a very important goal that Elder Tay will discuss with us in a few moments. We have added that we will strengthen our families as each family fasts, pays fast offerings, and each mem member is a full tithe payer. Our families will become stronger as we receive the promised blessings from paying our tithing and fast offerings. In order to establish the church in the Philippines, we must have real growth. This is accomplished as we increase the number of active Melchizedek priesthood holders 
and increase our sacrament meeting attendance. This year, we have experienced miracles as we have, as we have reached out to the less active and brought them back. We have increased the number of active Melchizedek priesthood holders in the Philippines from 22,173 to 24,158. This is an increase of almost 2,000 active Melchizedek priesthood holders. During that same time, our sacrament meeting has a, attendance has also increased dramatically. Last year at this time, we had 115,652 members attending sacrament meeting. Now it has increased to 121,446. This is almost 6,000 additional members attending sacrament meeting. Please watch this video clip of wards and branches that have been blessed as they have established the church in their units. Uh, before the um, area goal, the lunch, the um, average attendance namin ay umabot ng 70 lang. After namin na receive yung instruction for the, from the area na tungkol sa kanilang sa goal ng area, umabot na kami ng 120 ngayon average attendance or sacrament meeting. Ina-apply namin kasi yan during sa branch council meeting namin. Nag-maintain kami ng 15 names na kailangan namin discuss bawat names during our branch council meeting with our branch auxiliary leaders and other priesthood leaders. During sa aming discussion, tinitingnan namin kung ano ang needs ng every individuals. Binibisita namin sa mga member ng auxiliary sa council para ma-meet namin ang needs ng mga individuals na nakalagay doon sa 15 names namin. Nasabi ko na uh, we maintain 15 names na dinidiscuss namin during sa aming meeting. Nakafocus kami doon para matulungan namin sila makasimba, maka-attend sa sacrament meeting. Alright, this is what we did as a branch uh, presidency in our branch here in the new branch. Uh, first, we always follow up what are the things that we should do as a branch. And by, by in our PC meeting and every meeting that we have, and always encourage them to do the things which should be done in, in every family's of our brands. And by doing that, they will, more, they will be more encouraged to go to church and they cannot hesitate to do those things. Reading the scriptures is really big um, and a huge uh, resources for us as our leaders. Uh, by doing that, we may be more increase our spirituality and also be more influence our members by, by giving a good example to them, by reading scriptures in our own family and every, every members that we have. Okay. So sa ako, sa nakita na ko, na uh, hindi lang kami sa sacrament attendance nag increase Nakita ko rin na uh, when it comes sa uh, spiritual and temporal welfare sa mga members namin, especially yung 15 names, uh, nag improve sila. Kaya, mas maganda yung area goal na naibigay uh, na sa amin at na uh, gawa namin. Yung nakita ko rin sa, sa goal na yan na ginawa ng ating area presidency, uh, nagiging mas isa yung focus namin as a branch presidency and even as a branch. Iyan dapat ang aming gagawin, especially yung feasting upon the words of grace. Magiging nasa tumpaki sa amin na nagiging reality talaga na yung bawat member Kapag ginagawa nila ito, they will go to church. Even wala kami, they can do by their service. In 2013, you will notice that this goal has also changed slightly. We will continue to increase the number of Melchizedek priesthood holders and increase our sacrament meeting attendance. But this year, we have moved increasing the number of temple recommend holders under established in the church. We have done this because in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, all roads lead to the temple. We want to increase the number of members at sacrament meeting, but our ultimate goal is to receive all of the ordinances available to us in the temple. On the screen is a picture of a family in the Kauaian mission. They were baptized and then in one year received their endowments and were sealed together. This is what we hope to accomplish with all of our families in the Philippines. As we do that, we establish the church. The future of the church in the Philippines will depend upon how you and I teach 
and train the rising generation. We have incredible young men and young women here in the Philippines. I have traveled all over this country since I arrived, and I have met many of them. They are wonderful. We need to be sure that they are, we are pointing them in the right direction as parents and as leaders. We do that as we help them serve full-time missions. Already in 2012, we have more young men who have applied to serve a full-time mission than we have ever had in the history of the church in the Philippines. By the end of this year, 1,054 will have received their calls to serve full-time missions. That is more than we have ever had. When we couple that with the number of young women who have applied and who will apply now with the change in the age for all missionaries, we see a bright future in the Philippines. Please watch this video of a young man who was less active but made a choice this year to come back and serve a full-time mission. Naging less, less active po ako no, nung mula ah, nung 2001 po. Ah, paminsan-minsan lang po ako nagsisimba kung gusto ko. Ah, yung taong tumulong sa akin, yung aking kaibigan, na parang isa siyang parang guardian angel ko na nagtuturo sa akin nung, kung mali ba yung ginagawa ko, kung tama po ba siya. Parang, ina, parang inihila niya po ako na bumalik ulit sa simbahan kasi, kasi turing nga sa akin isang kaibigan talaga. Isang parang, parang kapatid. Ano? Ah, na, na, Napag-desisyonan ko na gusto ko ng mag-mission na sabi ng kaibigan ko na maganda daw sa mission kasi marami kang matututuhan doon. Pag uwi mo, yung kaalaman mo daw, mas magaling na kaysa sa teacher. Pero hindi naman yun yung habol ko eh. Ang habol ko yung ano, paano maging experience na, paano maging missionary talaga. Yung marami kang matulungan na tao na mabinyagan at lumapit po sa kay Kristo. Young men serving missions is an area that still needs great improvement here in the Philippines. Actually, we need to double or triple the number serving full-time missions. We have not yet come close to the 32,000 young men who are eligible to serve in the Philippines. We are also pleased to report that we have seen an increase in the attendance of our young single adults. Last year, we had 18,735 young single adults attending church. This year, that number has increased to 19,449. Moving forward to 2013, we must maintain our focus on getting young men on missions. We will continue to focus on activating and retaining our young single adults. You will see that we have added a critical new goal as we strive to save our rising generation. We must help them be sealed in the temple. Too many of our return missionaries and young single adults are delaying marriage and as a result are missing out on the wonderful blessings of having an eternal companion. This will require a change in the culture in the Philippines and a new focus on the teachings of the prophets and apostles. Elder Tay will address this new goal shortly. As we demonstrated during our broadcast last year, we have many less active members in the Philippines. As President Monson has so clearly taught, we must go to the rescue. In 2012, we have worked together as members, councils, and missionaries to bring back the less active. We have been very pleased with the diligence of all those who have made an effort. However, note that the goal was that every member rescues someone this year. Because we have over 120,000 active members in the Philippines, if we had all rescued someone this year, we would now have 240,000 active members, exactly twice what we have today. All of us must become converted to this work. Please watch this video clip as we show the blessings of the rescue.
Sabi niya gan po ako, July 2, 2011, one year and one month na po ngayon. Bilang isa pong ward mission leader, mahirap din po yung mag-reactivate ng mga, lalo na yung mga kamember natin na minsan, importante ipagkita natin yung desire natin na, na tutulungan natin. Minsan ginagawa ko po, kahit na lalo na yung mga inactive, magagawa kong salubungin sila sinasalubong ko. Unang binisita ko ni Brother Perez, sabi niya na magsimba ka sa linggo, nagsimba po ako, tuloy-tuloy na po. Nang natulong po sa akin ni Brother Perez yung faith, pagmano ng simbahan, uh, talaga mo sa akin, totoo po yung simbahan na ito. Masaya po ako na nakakatulong po ako para simple bagay sa calling ko. Kahit gano'ng katagal lang ang member na inactive, huwag tayong susuko. Lalong lalo na yung pag uh, yung home, bilang home teacher, yung visiting teacher na gawin po natin yung uh, alam natin na uh, lalong lalo yung mga responsibilidad ng bawat isa. Bilang bishop din yun ang madalas ko rin pong uh, no, si council sa aming mga sa aming uh, ward council uh, meeting uh, kung saan uh, palakasin yung uh, aming uh, home and visiting teaching. We are very grateful for the ward and branch councils who have worked with and maintained 15 names and have diligently brought back many to the blessings of the gospel. We are retaining this goal for 2013, but you will notice some slight differences. We are asking that each member rescue at least, at least one member this year, and once they are back, prepares them to receive the ordinances in the temple. We will ask our ward and branch councils to continue to work diligently with the 15 names and be sure you involve the full-time missionaries as we teach these less active members the doctrine of the gospel. These are our new area goals for 2013. Thank you to each of you for your valuable contribution to the work of the Lord this past year. Miracles have happened in many units in the Philippines. We are grateful for your good efforts. But can I say that we have not yet tapped the power and capacity of our members in assisting in this work. What we have accomplished has been done by a few good leaders. This year we must engage all of our members. We have begun to see what the Lord has in mind for the Philippines. Now we invite all of our active members to put their shoulder to the wheel. We ask each ward and branch council to work together this year again to set your own goals and to begin to act together to achieve those goals. This year, ask for revelation as to how we can engage all of our active members in accomplishing this work. Brothers and sisters, we are moving forward with a vision of the work. We are united. Shall we not go on in so great a cause? I bear my witness to you that God lives, that his son Jesus Christ is our savior and our redeemer, and that this is his work. And I share that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Elder Nielsen. It will now be my privilege to address you, brothers and sisters. And following my remarks, we will hear from Elder Ian Ezardern of the 70. And then following his remarks, we will close by singing hymn number 243, Let Us All Press On. And the closing prayer will be given by Sister Aleli Hovis. Brothers and sisters, when we reviewed our accomplishments for last year, we got very excited as an area presidency. Uh, we were just amazed at how much we have accomplished 
over a short period of time and with relatively very little effort. Just imagine how, how much good we can do together if we continue our course and put forth a little more effort. Remember, this is just the beginning. The best is yet to come. Elder Nielsen showed us, also showed us the goals for 2013, which you have noticed have not changed, but we added two additional priorities. We feel that it is important for us to continue to emphasize these same things. I will now discuss the two additional priorities that will help us further strengthen families and save the rising generation. We have asked that each family fasts every month and pays fast offerings and for each member to be a full tithe payer. We also want to increase the number of young single adults marrying in the temple. Allow me to share my thoughts on these priorities. Most of us struggle financially. Family incomes are often not enough to take care of our needs. Because of these circumstances, most consider the law of tithing very difficult to obey. It would be well for us to consider that the early saints were in a similar condition when God gave the revelation on tithing as recorded in section 119 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Allow me to enumerate some key phrases in that revelation. Number one, and this shall be the beginning of the tithing of my people. Those who have thus been tithed shall pay one-tenth of all their interest annually. Third, and this shall be a standing law unto them forever for my holy priesthood. Fourth, all those who gather unto the land of Zion shall observe this law, or they shall not be found worthy to abide among you. And fifth, if my people observe not this law to keep it holy, it shall not be a land of Zion unto you. In an earlier revelation, the Lord has also forewarned his people of further testing they will have to go through. Quote, Behold, now it is called today until the coming of the Son of Man, and verily it is a day of sacrifice and a day of the tithing of my people. For that, for those who have, shall be tithed shall not be burned at his coming. We often hear our leaders teach that tithing is paid with faith and not with money. It is because the law of tithing is counterintuitive. It is not logical and it does not make sense. It will never be understood by man's intellect alone. The world's reasoning will go something like this. If your income is not enough for your needs now, how will it be enough if you take another 10% to pay tithing? It doesn't make sense, does it? That is where faith comes in. We need to choose whether we want 100% of our income without the Lord's help, or we can settle for 90% plus the Lord's help. Consider the following promises from the Lord. Quote, Bring ye all the tithes into my storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. End of quote. This is one of the few commandments that the Lord actually asks us to put it to the test. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. Do we doubt his intentions and his promises? What does it mean to have no room for all of the blessings poured out from heaven? He has also said, quote, I the Lord am bound when ye do what I say, but when ye do not what I say, ye have no promise. So, when we do not pay our tithing, 
God is not bound and we are on our own. We are saying to him, I do not need your help and I will be all right. Do you suppose that God cannot get along without our tithing money? You and I know very well that he will do just fine without it. So why then is he asking us to pay tithing? The simple answer is, God wants to know if we are willing to put him first in our lives. He wants to know whether we love him more than anything else. I also believe that he is always trying to find an excuse to bless us because he loves us. However, for the Lord to truly bless us, our motives for paying tithing must needs go beyond that of merely expecting blessings. We must do so because we love him and desire to do his will. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we will, must be willing to obey even if our very lives are threatened. Here are some important things to remember as we obey the law of tithing. Number one, there are no promises to those who pay partial tithing. You are either fully committed or you are not. Number two, look forward to the promises for they are sure. Three, recognize the Lord's timing. Number four, the Lord knows what you really need. And number five, the real test is when we pay tithing because we love the Lord and not only because we want the blessings. In Matthew, we read, quote, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus saith unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On this too hang all the law and the prophets. End of quote. Obeying the law of tithing helps us to keep the first and great commandment, to love the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might. Clearly, obedience to the law of tithing is an expression of our love for Heavenly Father. It shows that we are willing to put Him first in our lives. I testify of the blessings the Lord promised to those who pay a full and honest tithing. What about loving our neighbor as ourselves? One of the best ways we can consistently show our love for our neighbor is by fasting each month and giving a generous fast offering. Think about it for a moment. How would you feel if a brother and his family would willingly go without food and water for a period of time to be able to help you in your difficulty? My heart will just melt with gratitude for such an act of compassion and love on my behalf. The prophet Isaiah also provided wonderful insights into this noble act which blesses not only the receiver but the giver as well. Quote, Is not this the fast that I have chosen to lose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free? and that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not yourself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy rearward, then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. End of quote. We need to be engaged not only in a spiritual, but also temporal rescue of our brothers and sisters. After all, we did promise to be able to bear 
one another's burdens that they may be light, mourn with those that mourn, and to comfort those who stand in need of comfort, and to stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things and in all places that ye may be in even until death. King Benjamin even indicated that doing so will allow us to retain a remission of our sins. Quote, For the sake of retaining a remission of your sins from day to day, and that ye may walk guiltless before God, I would that ye should impart of your substance to the poor. Every man, according to that which he hath, such as feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, and administering to their relief, both spiritually and temporally, according to their wants." End of quote. Fasting can also give us much needed spiritual strength and sensitivity. Let me just share one, that Alma's, which is Alma's description of the sons of Mosiah. Quote, but this is not all. They had given themselves to much prayer and fasting. Therefore, they had a spirit of prophecy and a spirit of revelation. And when they taught, they taught with power and authority from God. End of quote. I would like to reemphasize the following points regarding fasting and the payment of fast offerings. Number one, fasting is not complete without the giving of a generous fast offering. Number two, fasting and prayer brings with it an increase in spiritual power. And number three, we have a responsibility to care for the poor and the needy. I testify of the power that comes to us in our families as we fast every month and give generously to the poor and needy through the payment of fast offerings. I will now shift gears to talk to you about getting more young single adults to marry in the temple without delay. Please note the emphasis, brothers and sisters, without delay. We are concerned that many of our young single adults, especially the men, are postponing marriage for reasons that are contrary to the gospel culture. First, I will share with you what prophets and apostles have taught about the importance of marriage. Then, I will share with you some of Sister Tay's and my experiences as we try to overcome worldly traditions that seek to prevent or delay marriage. The family proclamation states, marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God, and that the family is central to the Creator's plan for the eternal destiny of his children. Elder David A. Bednar shared with us two compelling doctrinal reasons that help us to understand why eternal marriage is essential to Heavenly Father's plan. Doctrinal reason number one, the natures of male and female spirits complete and perfect each other, and therefore men and women are intended to progress together toward exaltation. End of quote. Male and female spirits are endowed with unique qualities and capacities. Individually and through personal righteousness, each will be able to achieve great heights. However, as each work together in a marriage relationship, they are able to reach even greater heights and achieve their greatest potential. Again from Elder Bednar, quote, the man and the woman contribute differently but equally to a oneness and a unity that can be achieved in no other way. The man completes and perfects the woman and the woman completes and perfects the man as they learn from and mutually strengthen and bless each other." End of quote. Doctrinal reason number two. By divine design, both a man and a woman are needed to bring children into mortality and to provide the best setting for the rearing and nurturing of children. End of quote. 
the sacred powers of procreation are to be employed only between a man and a woman legally married as husband and wife. They then become partners with Heavenly Father in bringing His spirit children here on the earth. This provides a setting where children can be reared, nurtured, and taught in love and righteousness. Children are entitled to birth within the bonds of matrimony and to be reared by a father and a mother who honor marital vows with complete fidelity. Picture for a moment, brothers and sisters, what a blessing it would be if more of Heavenly Father's children are born into families where the gospel of Jesus Christ is taught and testimonies are strengthened. Let us now listen to testimonies of two young couples who are newly married and who exercise their faith and follow the counsel of their leaders. I want you to remember, brothers and sisters, six weeks preparation. I know for a fact that many of you are, have been preparing for the last six years. Maybe some of you 16 years. When we are married, we can move forward together in love sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Unfortunately, many still adhere to the persisting incorrect traditions of our fathers that causes us to delay marriage. As a result, we are seeing immorality among our young single adults. We are also seeing young single adults who lose hope and their testimony. I would like to share some thoughts on some of the most common reasons why young single adults are postponing or delaying marriage in the hope that it will help to change this culture in the Philippines. Number one, lack of financial resources. To parents and young single adults, I say, exercise your faith. God will help you provide for your family if you are faithful and you work hard. You will have the means to sustain your family as you pay a full tithe and work together as husband and wife. Sister Te and I often think that when children are born to you, Heavenly Father sends blessings with them 
to help them survive. I have also observed from my experience that the Lord was careful not to give me too much in terms of resources as a single person because I did not need them and because I may not be, have been able to handle them appropriately. The second is education. In my conversations with returned missionaries, I am often asked the question, what should I do first? Finish my education first or get married? Instead of giving the obvious answer, which is marriage, I would ask a question in return. Do you know that you can get married and study, get an education at the same time? The usual answer, spoken or unspoken, is you mean I can do that? At one point in my life, when Sister Te and I were raising our children, I had a full-time job that required me to travel a lot of times. And I was going to school at night and serving as a bishop of our ward. When I graduated from college, we had two children and Sister Tay was five months pregnant with our third child. You may ask if I had to do it all over again, what would I change? My immediate response is nothing. I would not change a thing. I would do it exactly the same way because of what I have learned, how my faith has increased in God's promises, and how it brought my wife and me closer to each other. The next is employment. Please do not be picky in finding employment. As you are starting off, do not immediately expect to land jobs with lucrative pay. The important thing is you have a steady source of income while you are upgrading your resume and acquiring additional skills. When Sister Tay and I again got married, I was working as a messenger and was still putting myself through college. And while she, on the other hand, was working as a manager. To this day, she still teases me and by saying, I can't believe I married a messenger. <laughs> to that, I always replied, well, you saw my potential. <laughs> the next one is false traditions. You do not need to spend for a reception. That's the last thing you need. If you have to have one, it should not be extravagant you should focus on the ordinance and not on pleasing yourself or meeting the expectations of others. One of the worst ways to start marriage is by going into debt. During our wedding reception, and mind you, I'm Chinese, I should have a seven course meal. We held it in the chapel cultural hall. Sister Te and I just served juice, cookies, cake, and salad. Many parents also selfishly look to their children as their own retirement and won't allow their children to move forward with their lives and get married. Parents, we should not turn over to our older children the responsibility of raising and providing for the needs of their siblings. You should not even overburden them with financial demands that make them postpone or delay marriage. Of course, disability or death may necessitate individual adaptation. Are parents failing to see the blessings that marriage will be for their YSA and for themselves? Their married children will be much more stable and much more able and willing to help if needed. The next is a question. Is he or she the right person, the right one to marry? Well, to that, I would say, marry someone who inspires you to be a better person. If you love each other and you are true, both true to your covenants and are committed to making each other happy, I promise you, your marriage will work. After a few months of our marriage, I learned from our leaders the secret, secret of, truly, of a truly wonderful companionship. And it is this, Sister Tay and I love the Lord more than we love each other. 
And because we love the Lord more, we are able to love each other beyond our mortal capacity as individuals. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. I would like to conclude with President Monson's counsel to you young single adults. Now I've thought a lot lately about you young men who are of an age to marry. <laughs> but you have not yet felt to do so. I see lovely young ladies who desire to be married and raise families, and yet their opportunities are limited because so many young men are postponing marriage. This is not a new situation. Much has been said concerning this matter by past presidents of the Church. I share with you just one or two examples of their counsel said President Harold B. Lee, we are not doing our duty as holders of the priesthood when we go beyond the marriageable age and withhold ourselves from an honorable marriage to these lovely women." Close quote. President Gordon B. Hinckley said this, My heart reaches out to our single sisters who long for marriage I cannot seem to find it. I have far less sympathy for the young men who, under the customs of our society, have the prerogative to take the initiative in these matters, but in so many cases fail to do so." Close quote. I realize there are many reasons why you may be hesitating to take that step of getting married. If you are concerned about providing financially for a wife and a family, may I assure you that there is no shame in a couple having to scrimp and save. It is generally during these challenging times that you will grow closer together as you learn to sacrifice and to make difficult decisions. Perhaps you are afraid of making the wrong choice. To this I say, that you need to exercise faith. Find someone with whom you can be compatible. Realize that you will not be able to anticipate every challenge which may arise, but be assured that almost anything can be worked out if you are resourceful and if you are committed to making your marriage work. Perhaps you are having a little too much fun being single taking extravagant vacations, buying expensive cars and toys, and just generally enjoying the carefree life with your friends. I have encountered groups of you running around together, <laughs> and I admit that I have wondered why you are not with the young ladies. Brethren, there is a point at which it is time to think seriously about marriage and to seek a companion with whom you want to spend eternity. If you choose wisely and if you are committed to the success of your marriage, there is nothing in this life which will bring you greater happiness. When you marry, brethren, you will wish to marry in the house of the Lord. For you who hold the priesthood, there should be no other option. Be careful lest you destroy your eligibility to be so married. You can't, you can keep your courtship with improper bounds while still having a wonderful time. I invite leaders, parents, young single adults to study and gain an understanding of the doctrinal foundation and the central role of marriage in God's plan for the eternal destiny of His children. Doing so will help us change our views, discard false traditions, and develop faith to enter into a marriage covenant without delay. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
It has been a wonderful year as we have watched the work move forward in the Philippines. From the report by Alda Nielsen, you can see that we have had some successes and we thank you for the roles that you have played in helping to achieve them. I do note, however, that the Lord is easy to please and hard to satisfy. And so we must do more and we are certainly equal to that task. We have moved forward a few centimetres, but this year we must move forward by metres. And that will take the involvement of each of us. This moving forward, scripturally known as building the church, is a commandment of God. For we are told that Zion must increase in beauty and in holiness, her borders must be enlarged, her stakes must be strengthened. Nephi teaches us that the commandments of God must be fulfilled, and he doth provide the means whereby the children of men can accomplish the things which he has commanded them. The Lord will not ask any of us, brothers and sisters, to do things that we cannot accomplish. And that is certainly true of our area goals. To accomplish our area goals, we must first have a real desire to see them achieved. Scripture teaches, therefore, if ye have desires to serve God, you are called to the work. The prophet Alma testified, I know that God granteth unto men according to their desire. The doctrine is clear. If we desire something that is consistent with the will of God, he will help us to achieve it. Second, we must prepare ourselves spiritually, for in so doing, we will become equal to the task which has been given us of the Lord. Our personal spiritual preparation would include sincere and fervent prayer, fasting, feasting upon the words of Christ, service to others, repentance, and obedience to the commandments of God. The third necessity to achieve our area goals is our combined faith in Jesus Christ. It will not be good enough for us to say to the Lord, we want to have the members paying their tithes and offerings, but by the way, there are a few of us in our ward council who are not doing that. Surely leaders must at least be doing what is being asked so that the Lord can see our faith through our actions and then bless the lives of all the members to go and do likewise. One of Mormon's greatest sermons is just 19 words long. He said, if ye will have faith in me, ye shall have the power to do whatsoever thing is expedient in me. To go forward by meters is going to take the faith of all of us. There can be no exceptions. There can be no doubt in any of us that we can achieve these goals. For where there is doubt, there is no faith. Of course, faith without works is dead. And so the fourth requirement in order to help us to achieve our goals will be our good works. We must have a pure desire to succeed. We must prepare ourselves spiritually. We must go forth with faith in Christ. 
and we must work diligently to achieve our goals. I wish to speak clearly tonight so that there is no misunderstanding. I have already noted how grateful the area presidency is for what has been achieved to date. And we know it has been achieved through the good works of many of you. Yet, it's still not enough. There is more that needs to be done. And so tonight, we are calling for more. We're calling for more faith and more effort from each of us. I think of the parable in Matthew 21 where we read, a certain man had two sons, and he came to the first, and he said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not, but afterward he repented, and he went. And he came to the second son, and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. The Lord has called his sons and daughters to go and labor in the vineyard from Apari to Zamboanga and everything in between. And some have said, I go, but they go not. And yet others have said, they will go and have gone, but have become weary in the task and not remained focused on it. They were like the Kugan grass that President Tay spoke of last year. This year, my dear brothers and sisters, we must all go and we must all stay the course. To help us stay the course, I will share with you tonight some practical ideas on how to achieve the goals which have been introduced. These ideas I have gathered as I have traveled around the Philippines and looked back into my own life. I offer special thanks tonight to the mission, stake and district presidencies in Iloilo who shared their insights with me. The suggestions are certainly not ex exhaustive, but should be helpful for leaders and parents looking for a place to start. Because of time, I will address just one of the goals under each of the headings that have been introduced by Elder Nielsen, and then give practical examples for each. The first, then, is strengthening families. Ideas to help each family member to have their own scriptures and to read them daily. Idea number one, set a personal example by reading and pondering your scriptures each day. Regardless of our circumstances, there is always time for time in the scriptures. Read to understand the doctrine so that you can share what you learn. I was always pleased to have my children see me reading the scriptures and I testify to each of you this night that it made a positive difference in their attitude about the scriptures. Number two, use the scriptures when you teach, example is the silent teacher. And when family and stake members see you teaching from the scriptures, it will magnify the importance of the scriptures. We encourage you to never teach a sermon without reference to the scriptures and the words of the prophets. Our promise is that of the Lord, that as you study his word, 
it shall be given you in the very hour, in the very moment, what ye shall say. We encourage families to do the readings of their Sunday lessons. With a, the new youth curriculum beginning this month, teachers will be encouraged to ask parents about the spiritual needs of their children and lessons will be planned to meet those needs. Discussing those lessons with reference to the scriptures will strengthen the family. As shown in this photo, some gospel doctrine classes of some wards have given out booklets with the scripture blocks to encourage scripture reading. Finally, set a family goal to read daily from the scriptures. When our children were young, and you can see from the calendar on the screen that this was in 1989, we marked a calendar for each day we read as a family from the Book of Mormon. The children were young and their attention span was short. So we settled on reading a page a day and then each child took a turn reading and putting a sticker on the calendar. They did not want to miss their chance to place a sticker and soon a habit of daily reading from the scriptures was formed. Our second area goal has establishing the church as its focus. And so let us look at three ideas that could help with this area of focus. To establish the church through an increase in sacrament meeting attendance. Our first suggestion is that you priesthood leaders set a goal. Little progress will be made where there is no goal. Those bishops who have increased their sacrament meeting attendance last year started by having a goal. They saw where they were, discussed the issue in council, and determined where they wanted to be, made plans to get there, and measured their progress along the way. Their motivation was not simply an increase in numbers, but an increase in members who were able to attend the sacrament service and renew their baptismal covenants and be edified by their fellow saints. For these bishops and branch presidents, every number was accompanied by a name, and his desire for them to attend was motivated by a love for them. There is certainly wisdom in following the prophet's counsel. President Monson said, when performance is measured, performance improves. When performance is measured and reported, the rate of improvement accelerates." End quote. An additional idea is to plan sacrament services that will uplift those who attend. Of course, those who attend sacrament services must prepare themselves spiritually for the meeting. But in addition, careful planning by the bishopric makes a difference for good. Prelude music, starting the meeting on time, having the sacrament ready well before the meeting begins, and well-prepared speakers and musical numbers all make for an uplifting sacrament service experience and will naturally result in an increase in attendance. A third means of establishing the church is to invite others to attend the sacrament meeting. It's really, brothers and sisters, that simple. 
just invite others to join with you. Those you home or visit teach, your neighbours, your friends, and those who used to sit beside you when at church in your meetings. Go and visit them. Knock on their door. And tell them, with all the love you can muster, that you have missed them and you've come to invite them back. They'll not be offended by such an invitation. They will thank you for showing your love and concern. Start with your own family members where needed and then attend your sacrament services as a family. We do not want anyone to be left behind. The third area of focus for our area goals is the rising generation. As Elder Nielsen indicated, we have had more of them attending church and serving as missionaries than ever before, but there is still ample room in our chapels and our missions for young men and women. Saving the rising in a generation ideas to help increase the number of missionaries serving include the following. These ideas come because we are passionate about this goal as an area presidency. And so here are four ideas. Number one, every missionary on his or her release needs to find someone to replace them. We are inviting each stake and mission president to talk with those missionaries they will release this year. A release of a missionary is just half of the journey. Presidents, as you release a missionary, we ask that you immediately call them to find their replacement. And we do not refer to someone who is already preparing. The low-hanging mangoes are easy to reach. We certainly know that in the Philippines. These people being released are seasoned missionaries. And so invite them to reach a little higher up the tree. Ask them to work with their bishop to identify someone who should be preparing but is not and to be their personal mentor to help them to prepare for full-time missionary service. We release about 1,000 Filipino missionaries each year and as every released missionary fulfills his or her first priesthood given assignment, we will have, by the end of 2013, an additional 1,000 missionaries, at least, called to labor in the field. Call them to do it, presidents, and then follow up for where there is no accountability, as we have learned from President Monson, it is unlikely that there will be the needed action. A second recommendation is that priesthood leaders personally invite prospective missionaries to prepare themselves to complete the missionary application process. Presidents and bishops may need to sit with them in order to have this achieved. They will need help in many cases to move through the process. A simple form as the one shown and prepared by Brother Aquino is just one way of tracking the preparation of a prospective missionary. 
An early personal invitation may be all that is needed to make the difference. Call upon the young men to fulfill their priesthood duty to serve as a full-time missionary and invite those young women who would like to serve to do so. An additional suggestion is missionary preparation classes and attendance at institute. If I were a bishop today or a stake president, I would ensure that all of my prospective missionaries were enrolled in missionary preparation classes. If there was no established class in my stake or district, and by the way, last year we concluded with just 136 classes in all of the Philippines, I would call a returned missionary who is well versed in preach my gospel as the teacher and have the seminary and institute coordinator train him or her, supply the class manuals, and then put the teacher to work. Part of the class could be a call to serve as a stake missionary, and then to share the experiences of the work in class. Ward missionaries from every stake and district is good preparation for missionary service. A missionary preparation class can be held on a Sunday if it is not counted as part of an institute, institute course. An additional suggestion is that no person stands alone in missionary preparation. Priesthood and family members should stand shoulder to shoulder and their determination to have all young men and those young women who choose to serve missions. The home is the first missionary training center and the first teachers of our prospective missionaries are mothers and fathers. Of the missionaries called last year, 69% of them came from families where both parents are members and an additional 15% came from families where one of the parents is a member. These numbers tell us that we have a mighty army of member parents that can pr help prepare the young single adult to serve honorable full-time missions. An idea that helped in our home was to have an expectation that our sons would serve. To help show that expectation to our youngest son, Sister Ardern had him make and put the following picture up in the room he frequented the most when he was not asleep. Yes, the television room. Six years later, this was replaced with a mission call. And then we made a display of mission calls from our family members. This is just one idea from a mother that made a difference, and of course, there are many others. We encourage you tonight to act on what you believe will help your sons in particular to serve the Lord as full-time missionaries and as they are obligated as holders of the priesthood. The next goal is the rescue. It is the fourth area of focus for the area goals. In this section, I wish to just make some general observations about the rescue. As you are aware, we've had a three-pronged approach to the rescue. The strongest approach has been that of the missionaries. But the strongest approach, as Elder Nielsen so clearly explained, should have been the active members. If we took just the active youth and adults alone, and each one of us 
had brought back just one, we would have had a significant increase in our sacrament attendance. But alas, we did not. Three simple ideas about the rescue are as follows. None of us can afford to leave the rescue to someone else. When a lifeguard sees someone drowning, he or she does not say, hmm, the water's too cold. I don't want to get wet. You know, I'm enjoying the sun at the moment. Or, you know, there could be a shark out there. Or perhaps, I'm not actually sure if that person wants to be rescued or not. Inconvenient or as frightening as the rescue may be, the lifeguard goes to the rescue. Each of us, brothers and sisters, must go to the rescue of members who have drifted into deep and troublesome water. A magic plan is not needed. A committee does not need to be formed for a personal rescue. And nor does there need to be ongoing meetings. Each of us just needs to decide who the person is that needs to be rescued and go to work with the Lord and perform the rescue. Please, as an additional recommendation, use the ward council, bishops and branch presidents. Some wards have made good use of the ward councils and identified by name those that they would rescue. Wards that use the new and returning remember report so that they can follow the steps mapped out on the report have greater success at rescuing. Lifeguards do better when they have a rescue board to help them. And you will do better when you use the rescue tools the Lord has provided. Simply put, each ward needs to work with names. For as President Torres recently said, I cannot interview numbers. A third suggestion for the rescue is to have an improved correlation with the missionaries. We anticipate a significant increase in the number of missionaries serving in the Philippines and therefore you can expect to see more missionaries assigned to more wards and branches. Having more does not necessarily mean more success unless we plan to use the missionaries wisely. Wise use of missionaries would include improved correlation with them in the rescue effort. Calling a missionary to serve as a ward mission leader, teaching him his responsibilities, and then putting him to work will increase the number being rescued and retained. Tonight, brothers and sisters, we have reviewed a few simple ideas to help achieve the area goals. The best ideas will come as you sit in council and ask, what more can we do? And then act upon the council decisions and the promptings of the Holy Ghost. Thinking alone will achieve nothing. We must stand and act, and my promise is that the rewards will be great. Again, I thank you for all that has been achieved. You have done such a good work. We have every reason to be pl pleased with the results achieved, but the journey has just begun. And to quote President Tay, the best is yet to come. Know that I know that God lives, that Jesus Christ is our Savior and Redeemer, 
that he looks down upon the people of the Philippines and has great expectations of them and great blessings in store for them as we move forward in his will. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, we feel so blessed tonight to be a part of this wonderful program of this church. We are grateful for the presence of our area presidency and other priesthood authorities. We're thankful for the inspirations and the instructions that was extended unto us. And we thank Thee for the blessings that our country has received from Thee. Father, at this time we pray that Thou will strengthen our faith and our testimonies that as we continue striving to achieve our goals as individuals and as members of this church. We, ble we pray to bless us with cheerful hearts and cheerful faces as we continue serving thee and our fellow men. Help us to become good examples, especially to our children and to other people. And may the Holy Spirit be upon us as we continue walking into the right path. We love thee and this is our prayers in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you.